All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Kabbalah Cafe. This is our Sunday morning spelunk, spelunk, spelunking, into, uh, yeah, like cave exploration, into Kabbalah, into all things mystical and all things spiritual. Okay, so um, welcome everybody who's here in person. Welcome everybody who is joining us online. And it is, uh, it's really, truly great to see everybody here this morning. All right, so today's topic is, hey, Jeff, good morning. Today's topic is all about angels, all about angels. And I want to begin. I know I'm sitting next to you. Yes, <laughs> yes. Keep, what do they say? Keep your angels close and keep, no, kidding. Keep your, uh, yeah. We got we got the angels right here. Um, keep your devil. I didn't want to say that, you know, because white doesn't make an angel. <laughs> All right. So um, I also want to just just do a quick shout out to our online crew, Mariana. Welcome, great to see you, Ellen and Joy and John. Welcome, 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 Yaakov. Good morning. Okay, so the topic is angels, and angels is a angels are a very interesting topic. Because although it may seem completely far out and out there and not something that we might not that we necessarily speak about in Judaism, but when you think about it, there's a lot of mention of angels in Jewish conversation. So let's do this in a bit of an interactive way. Okay, let's do this in a bit of an interactive way. And I'm going to ask you the questions. This is a bit of a, of a biblical um, pop quiz. Tell me a story that you remember from the Torah that deals with angels. Torah story. Good. All right. So story number one that we have are the three angels that visit Avram. Those three angels appeared like men, but really they were angels and they came to uh, they came to do a few different things. One was to heal Avram. One was to bring him news of a child. And one was to overturn the city of Sodom and the other cities that were destroyed. Okay, good. Jacob's other ladder. Jacob's ladder. Oh, good. Yaakov, good. Perfect. You guys buzzing at the same time. We're going to call it a tie. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, Jacob's ladder. So we have the famous dream where Yaakov is leaving home. And of course he's leaving home because yeah, you know, usual stuff. His brother wants to kill him, et cetera. So he has to leave home and on the road, he lies down to sleep and he sees, he lies down and he sees a, an image of a ladder uh, or the, the vision of a ladder and on it, the angels, the angels are Olim VR Dimbo, going up and down. And as we discussed in a previous Kabbalah Cafe session a little while ago, um, I asked the question then, why are the angels going up and then down? Seemingly, if angels are coming from heaven, they should first be coming down and then going up. And I explained, based on what it says in Kabbalah and other Jewish sources, that the reason for this is because these were angels created by Yaakov created or specifically created by Yaakov's prayers. And that's why they first, they started on earth with Yaakov davening. And then they went up and then they came back down with the, um, with the blessings and the, uh, and, and the, and, and the good tidings. I'm going to get, I'm do a deeper dive into the meaning of that and how that teaches us about the function and, and purpose of angels soon. We'll get there. We'll, we'll get back to that soon. Other stories of angels. What other Yaakov's <laughs> oh, oh wrestling the wrestling match. match oh i didn't even remember that burn good morning i didn't even remember that the wrestling match thank you very much huh he won the jacob won the belt he won the heavyweight belt that was the first and only time that you won a wrestling match i'm kidding no there's ron yeah, but what's um, for that we behave with that with your strip stakes i know i know i know right thank you very much for getting socked in the thigh right because now we can't have the get Hanusha. Right, exactly. And that's gonna explain. Oh. Yeah, well, listen, I I uh I can only say what it says, but but the interesting thing is that the Torah once again describes it as uh describes this being as a man. It says, Vayevater Yaakov Levado, Yaakov remained, Jacob remained alone, Vayavek Ish Imo, and a man wrestled with him until until daybreak. So once again, we have this terminology that seems to depict a human being in the in the conversation and yet we have it by tradition that this was an angel and even the verses allude to the fact that this was no mm -hmm. ordinary, ordinary man but rather this was <laughs> an angel so, um yes ace of guardian angel exactly the clash of the titans 
And this was wow. the mm -hmm. battle that happens before the uh, the encounter the next morning. And once that's kind of uh, cleared away, then everything else is is a little bit smoother. By the way, I uh, I shared in a sermon that I gave, I guess, when that parsha was happening a few months ago in the shul. So I shared a beautiful uh, insight from one of the commentaries. Why did the angel hit him in the thigh? Right? What was up? What was he dislocated his, his hip. Why did he do that? So uh, this commentary says that... Yeah, well, <laughs> no, the commentary says the reason is because Yaakov had demonstrated the propensity to flee in the face of conflict. So, for example, when he got in conflict with his brother, he ran away. When he got in conflict with his uncle slash father-in-law, so Lavan, so he also ran away in the middle of the night. So he had demonstrated that when things get a little sticky, when things get a little tense, that, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to deal with the problem. I'm going to run away from the problem. And so the angel was kind of saying, you won't be able to run away from the problem because you can't move. You're going to be hobbling and you're going to be limping. So you won't be able to run away. And thus you'll have to face the problem. And, and the message of that is that when you face the monster, the scary thing, it turns out it's not so bad. Oh, man, it's not, e it's, not, it's not easy, but you face it, you confront it, you deal with it, and then you can move on. Otherwise, you're always running away from the same thing. This is a truth in life, right? That you run away from the same thing, and that thing keeps on coming back because you've never dealt with it. So on a level of, you know, if you think on a cosmic level that these are sparks that I need to refine, or this is an experience that I need to somehow combat or conquer, the, the more we run away from it, the more it's going to come back because you still have that mission in life. You still have that spark to, to, to engage in. And as long as that hasn't been uh, fully executed, as it were, then it's just going to keep, it's a recurring thing. The example of that is, um, is uh, what's his name? Is, um, help me out here. Who's the guy in the ship? Jonah. Thank you, Jonah, right? <laughs> Sorry, you had her phrase as a question. Who is Jonah? <laughs> right? So Jonah, is this, that's a story, right? He's also running away. And, and what's the message? Why all the drama in the story of Jonah? It's very simple. God is telling Jonah and really telling us that when you have a mission and you run away from it, it follows you. It's going to follow you. Yeah, you're going to run away on a boat. Guess what? The boat's going to gonna, you know, be rocky. You're going to get thrown overboard, swallowed by a large fish, then spit out, and then have to deal with it anyway. So you know what? <laughs> Avoid the drama. How come Save... we're smart enough to know that Jonah didn't? We, I don't know that we're that smart. Um, no, I mean, no, oh, no. Present company included in your statement. But I think that human beings still have this lesson to learn, which is that it's always best to deal with the things that are uncomfortable as opposed to kicking it down the road because kicking it down the road doesn't actually solve anything. It just literally kicks it down the road to come up to manifest at a later point sometimes in a more harsh or severe way. So the point of, of, of Jonah's story is, again, no need for the drama, just do it. By the way, one thing to point out about the Jonah story, because we've, we've gone there, we've segued from just, just to, to trace the, uh, you know, the, the breadcrumb, right? So angels, Jacob's wrestling with the angel, hitting him on the, on the hip, dislocating his hip, um, hobbling, limping, he can't run away. People who run away, for 400, and then we have um, we have Jonah. But anyway, speaking of Jonah, well, the reason... Something with the donkey, too? Bilam, yes, yes, good, hold on. But that's angels, that's on topic. We're still off topic. One second, I'll, be, I'll get back on topic in a second. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what are you doing bringing us back on topic? How dare you? All right, but no, but just very quickly about Jonah, one of the reasons why, or the reason, according to the commentary, is why he didn't want to fulfill that mission. Just so everyone knows here, because sometimes it can get lost in... He, the king of Nineveh, sorry, Nineveh, the nation of Nineveh and the king of Nineveh, they were enemies of the Jewish people and they were actively harassing and also exiling the Jewish people. The 10 lost tribes, they were part of making them lost, picking them off one by one. This was a problem. And God is basically telling a Jewish prophet, go and help out the enemy. And, and the prophet says, Jonah says, really? Thank you very much. I'm out. I'm out. I want nothing. I want to go in international waters. I want to have nothing to do. It says that prophecy only works in Israel. So he says, I'm out. I'll be on the, I'll be on the water and I do not want to get bothered. And Hashem basically showed him, yeah, technically prophecy may be in Israel, but right. I'm still following you. Right. And, and the idea here is that we don't know the master plan. And, and although 
you know, it was it was heartbreaking for Jonah to be part of that type of aiding and abetting the enemy. Nonetheless, that was for whatever reason his mission, and he could not abdicate that. Um, back to the story. So let's do more angel stories. More angel stories Bilaam. is Bilam. So Bilam slash Balam in the English. So Balam, Bilam. So he was um, an evil prophet or a prophet for profit, a prophet for hire. He was an assassin, a verbal assassin. He would try to take down people with his words, with his curses, as the Torah says. So the king of Moab comes to get a piece of stone for our wedding. One second, and the king says, hey, we have this, 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 this threat, the Jewish people. Can you go and curse them? And he says, I can't really do anything that God doesn't want. He tries, though, because it's a good payday. And bottom line is that at some point he heads off on the journey on his donkey. And the Talmud has a lot to say about the donkey, which we will absolutely not get into right now, because that is for another class and another um, yeah. an, well, another rating of film, right? What are the film ratings? What are they? MP? What's the? MC17. No, 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 no. But also, but what's the what's the organization that rates movies? The M, uh, whatever it is. The no, no, whatever. The... No, no, not rating if it's good or bad. Yeah, the motion picture, the MPA, whatever it is. So that, so the, the rating on that story is a little bit uh, not for today's session. The point is, he, he's on his donkey, and he is, and the donkey is confronted by an angel, or the the angel is blocking the way and in the way, and the donkey sees it, and Bilam doesn't. And one of the greatest moments of biblical comedy. There's not that many moments of biblical <laughs> comedy, but there, this is one where we have this guy who's all proud of himself. I'm the prophet. I can see, I can curse, I can bring down people. And meanwhile, his donkey can see more than he can see. So that's like, there you go. It's basically, yeah. And what did Billam say? Oh, you Shrek. <laughs> anyway, the do donkey was talking and the next thing you know, Anyway, so that's uh, that's another angel story. More angel stories, biblical angel stories. Yes. Yes. Joshua encounters the angel with the sword in the field. What other angel stories? Good. Oh, yeah. Abraham by the Akedah, by the binding of Isaac. What else? And then uh, an angel, very similar to Bilam, another angel trying to kill someone that they don't see. Uh, Moses. Oh, oh, the angel tries to kill the, uh, Moses' son when he goes down to Egypt. Right. On the way down, right? Remember Moses' son wasn't circumcised? Because they were traveling. He thought it's not good to travel while circumcised. But meanwhile, the angel's like, nope. And it swallowed him. Angel assumed the form of a snake and swallowed him from his foot to the bris area and from his head to the bris area. And he realized it's the bris. And he mostly didn't know what to do. So his wife, Tzipora, went ahead and brissed him up. Yeah. Okay. Thank God. Thank God she was carrying the bris kit. All right. I don't promise that they'll be good. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Okay, huh? Which is, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're saying I'm, I'm doing well in that, in that area. Okay, <laughs> would we stop? Would I stop? I don't know, we'll have to see. Okay, so let's, uh, so, so now we've established that there's a lot of angel stories. When you think about angels in Judaism and Torah. You might think angels, ah, it's not. But when you when you go through the stories, you realize angels are everywhere. Now, let's talk about prayer. Tefillah. When, when we're praying in the, in the morning, every morning, including Shabbat. So, and we, we actually did this, I think, uh, in an earlier, in a previous Kabbalah Cafe session as well. I think probably the same one that we talked about Jacob's Ladder, where we talked about the four stages of Tefillah, the four rungs of the ladder of davening. And the, the stage, there's a stage that is the pregame for the Shema prayer, the pregame of Shema. So the Shema is like, you know, the ultimate prayer. I mean, the Amida also, but like the Shema is like a super holy prayer. Before the Shema, we recite a few blessings. And those blessings and those prayers that are part of those blessings speak extensively about angels. The Ofanim, Chayot HaKodesh, the Srafim, all these angels. Ofanim are like, Ofanim literally means wheels. The wheel angels, right? The wheel angels of heaven. Okay. Yeah, you, okay. 
<laughs> All right. So, so we have the wheel angels. I'm sorry. And then we have the, um, okay. So those are the Ophanim. Chayat HaKodesh, whole, literally holy animals. Then you have the Srafim are the um, fiery angels. It's like Sraf or like fire, burning angels. And all of these are existing in various spaces in the mystical realms. So you have angels that occupy the world of Berea, the world of creation. Angels that, uh, that occupy the world of Yitzira, the world of formation. So you have these, so just to backtrack, just make sure everyone's on the same page here. Kabbalah speaks of four mystical worlds, four worlds. There's the world of Atzilut, emanation. World of Bria, creation. World of Yitzira, formation. And the world of Asiya, which is the world of action. We exist, this experience is happening the lower half of the world of Asiya. So we are Asiya side B, right, of the mixtape. So turn it over, we're side B of Asiya. That's where we are. The angels exist in the higher rungs, higher realms. Yitzira, primarily Bria. The difference between these worlds, just so you know, in general, um, these four worlds correspond to four energies. Atzilut is godly. Bria is intelligence. Yitzira is emotion, and Asiya is more material, physical, or more action-oriented. So there are angels in Bria and Yitzira. In other words, there are angels that are intellectuals, intellectual angels, and then angels that are emotional. So angels that are marked by more of an awareness and understanding and appreciation of the source. And then there are angels that feel the source, the more emotional ones. They understand less. They feel more. The ones that are the emotional ones, those are the ones that are like the srof and the ones that burn up. Those ones that get super excited, they get so excited, they pop out of existence. They literally, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They implode. They implode. Internally combust, right. Both both would be perfect. Right. They get so excited they or they short circuit. Calm down, and, Helen. Helen, you get excited. Calm down. Right. If Helen were an angel, just, yeah. Right, then, yeah. So you have these angels that are emotionally inclined and they feel so much, but they get so excited, poof. And then you have angels that are more intellectually inclined. Now, the difference between intellect and emotion, we all have intelligence and emotions, is that intellect is more behesyashvut, which means more settled, and emotions are more volatile. It's the nature. So uh, intelligence is denoted in Kabbalah as being something cold, Right, intelligence is cold, whereas emotion is hot. If we were going to assign temperatures to it, so the cold water would be the intelligence and the hot water would be the emotion. Why? Because intelligence is typically a little bit more detached, more analytical, more objective. It's about, it's about the idea. Whereas the emotion is about how I feel about it and that's already personal and then you get involved and then it, it's, it's, more, it's more animated. So there are angels that exist in both of these spaces. In our prayers every morning, we, we refer to all the angels and we talk about how the angels think about God and understand God and recognize God and get so excited about how great God is. And the purpose of all of this is to remind ourselves, this is the important part, to remind ourselves how even the holy angels that, 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 are, that are these points of light in, in, in Shemaim in heaven, even these angels have such an awesome they they, uh, they they view god in such an awesome way and they they understand and appreciate the greatness of hashem let alone us we should certainly appreciate hashem and then the other point is and this is the kicker that we say right before shema that despite the angels despite the heavenly beings who did hashem choose who did god choose to give the torah to the care of tanu right the care of tanu he brought us close care of tanu he brought us close to his service. Hashem, right? God Almighty entrusted us with his Torah and mitzvot. He didn't give it to the angels. He gave it to us, which tells us of how, how important our mission is in life and how much God trusts us. And that should evoke a love for God. God, you are so great. Even the angels are, are, are flabbergasted at your greatness. And yet, despite your greatness, you want a relationship with us? Now we can say Shema. And we have to talk about God's love for us and our love for him, right? We should love God because God loves us. And that's how, that's how we integrate into the Shema, which means 
what I'm really trying to say is that the Siddur, the prayer book, is very well crafted to evoke ideas and feelings. It's very well crafted. Our, um, the ideal when we dive in is that we should try to pay attention and, 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 and recognize the journey that we're on. And not every day are we going to have the wherewithal and the presence of mind to, you know, to, 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 to be aware of all of the ideas. But the more we think about it and the more we review this, hopefully the more dominance we have that, that are really meaningful you know, in, 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 in a very real way. But getting back to angels, angels appear everywhere. I spoke about um, Torah. There's a famous, um, a famous Talmudic passage where the Talmud discusses uh, what happened right before the giving of the Torah. Moses went up the mountain to receive the Torah. And the angel said to God, why is this? Um, I think they called him Yilud Isha, this uh, son of a, of, a, of a mother. That's what they call him, right? Why is he here? Unbelievable. Who? Yeah. Yeah, what is this human being, this mortal, doing amongst us? And God says to uh, God says to get the Torah, and so the angels say, "No, to Nahodcha Give your give your glory, Torah, to the heavens. We should have the Torah. The angels should have the Torah." And so Moses is like, this is super awkward. I thought I was just going to do a pickup, <laughs> right? Now it's, you know, like when you're in a situation, you're like, I didn't think it was going to get complicated. I was just like, I, was just I have the info. I don't, I'm just, huh? What did you say? What did I literally, I just got this job. You know, I don't really know too much about the inner workings. I'm just like. On he, yeah, yeah. And like one toe or something. Who knows what they have? Like our wing. Something man ever since that. They been? they have, and we've co-opted stuff like the Baruch shame, whatever. It's a whole. But they, there's a lot of beef. Is that why we have the absence of angels now? We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk. We have a lot of angels though, but let's we'll get there in a second. So 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 God says to Moshe to Moses, "You answer, you answer." Then Moshe's like, "Are you kidding me? I'm going to answer." So it says that Moshe grabbed onto God's um, throne, the Kisei Akavod, God's throne. And he began, began to answer. He said, Torah, the Torah that you want. What does it say in there? I am the Lord your God who took you. The Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. He says, were you in Egypt? To the angels. Were you in Egypt? What does it say? Don't have any other gods. Would you ever dream of having any other gods? What else is it? And he goes, honor your mother and father. Do you have a mother and father? He says, um, do not kill. Do not steal, etc. Like, Do you have these inclinations? Do you have these desires? Do you have the, these temptations that you need a warning not to? And so God said to Moses, right? Good job. That was a good job nudge. And, uh, and the angels relented. And the Torah, uh, happily ever after, the Torah was given to mankind. Um, that's a story that's told. Of course, there's a lot of depth to that story and exactly what they were saying ob seems obvious based on Moses' answer, Moshe's answer that the Torah wasn't applicable to the angels. What were they even thinking? So obviously Torah could be understood on many different levels and there's physical ways and, and spiritual ways, et cetera. But the point of all of this is, the point of all of this is that angels are ever present in Jewish thought, in Torah literature, in our prayers, in the Talmud, in fact, do another quick plug. We just started our course, Supernatural, last week. It is a phenomenal course. And lesson three is all about angels and demons and ghosts and all those. Sort of, sorry, lesson four is all about those, um, those beings. So just know that angels are very well discussed. So today, I want to speak about what angels are and what angels aren't. We'll do a quick, um, a quick uh, um, uh, conversation about angels. So angels are points of divine energy and divine light that are primarily intended to be messengers. Angels, malachim, are messengers that care, typically carry things from one space to another. Obviously, we're not talking about physical space necessarily, but conceptually, they are, they are carriers. The, the movements, the way spiritual energy moves is via angels. Now, if you're picturing an angel as a white creature with fluffy wings, then already that's a distortion of, I mean, that's the way it's depicted in Hollywood or wherever, right, or in art, but that's not, obviously angels don't have any physical features, 
angels are really movements of energy that are designed to be messengers to move things around. So for example, as I alluded to before, when Yaakov prays, sorry, when Yaakov dreams of the, of the ladder, which is the ladder of prayer, what he's seeing are, are angels going up and down the ladder. Those angels are really carrying the packets of information, as it were, above to below. Does anyone speak of packets anymore when it comes to data, internet data? Back in the day, it was packets. Remember that? It was all packets because it was so slow. It's like, oh, I see the packet moving. It's moving really slow. Follow the packet. Anyway, it's like, but it's like packets of information. It's like it's it's bits, bytes, whatever, moving up. So when we pray, it says in our source and good Jewish sources. So every word that we utter creates an angel. And that angel ascends above and acts as our advocate for what we want. And then angels come back down, right? Those are the angels going up. Angels come back down with the response from above. And so it's, you know, when we think about angels, it's, it's not fluffy creatures, but it's really the movement of energy up and then the movement of energy down. Those carriers of energy are what we refer to as angels. Angels can also take on, these messengers can also take on physical form, as we see in the stories of Torah that we, we mentioned up until now. And so angels can serve all these different roles, but typically angels are, um, what's the phrase, one-trick ponies? They only do one thing, and that's it. Every angel has its, it's a very um, singular, I don't know, whatever the so right word is. So there are a lot of angels out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angels for days. Zillions, more angels than people. Who knows how many angels? Angels, nonstop. So every angel has one specific mission. Yeah. So I'll tell you a story. There was once a young mother who was very um, anxious about being a mom. She was afraid that she's going to you know, not know how to take care of her kid and, you know, drop her child and whatever. Like she was just afraid, very anxious. And so she met with the Rebbe. This is probably back in the 50s or 60s, back in the day. And the Rebbe told her that every child has guardian angels. And so they, they will protect, you know, like don't, you don't need to worry because you got a little bit of backup. You got a little bit of backup to help with, uh, with the everyday, you know, um, imperfections in human parenting. You got, you, got the, uh, you, you got the angels that can help. As far as angels intervening, it sounds like angels can help. But every angel, um, the angels don't go rogue, which means that if there's an angel that's intervening, it means that that's its mission. It's a messenger to intervene in a certain way. Now, your question is, how often does that happen? It's hard to know. It's hard to know whether when nothing eventful happens, if it's because nothing eventful happened, or it's because there was an intervention to make sure that nothing eventful happened. Uh, pursuant to that, there's a story in the Torah, one of my favorite stories, that is usually completely ignored. It's in, it's in the book of Bamidbar, book of Numbers, and the story goes that the Jews were on, their, on the march, the final approach to Israel, and there was a uh, there was a, a a valley, and there was two um, I don't know like two cliffs or two mountains, huh? Yeah, cliffs on either side, and there were the um, the enemy. What was it Ammon? Maybe I don't remember. One of the nations was was standing on the um, on the on the caves inside the the cliff, and when the Jews were going to pass through the valley, they were going to throw. You know, they were going to throw boulders and rocks at them and, and whatever other swords and spears and who knows, God forbid. What God did before the Jews approached is he smushed the two cliffs or mountains or hills, whatever, together. And it crushed the people, right, the enemy that was laying in wait. And then the Jews walked in their path. Now, I don't know logistically, did that mean they had to climb up because it was close? I don't know, whatever. But they only found out later because they saw, however they saw, they saw like streams of blood and they saw other things says they saw the whatever anyway they stay they saw the um the remnants of the enemy and they realized that this was a miracle it was the arnon brook the arnon brook ran through that area or that's what washed up the uh the remains and uh and then they sang a song they created a shira they created a song at the arnon brook and the jews sang a song thanking hashem and so the point is that sometimes your path is secure but you don't know what went in that path to make it secure. Like right? how many challenges were eliminated before you got there. And sometimes some, the evidence washes up. Sometimes you, you, you get a glimpse into what went into a normal day. 
But most of the time, we take it for granted. We take it for granted that we get up in the morning and we get dressed and we go on our day. We take it for granted that things work without drama, without interruption. And it's only the perceptive eye that says, I take nothing for granted and I recognize that everything is a miracle and the product of divine intervention, whether in the form of direct intervention or via angels. The, the big idea we're going to say today is that when angels intervene, it's not it's it's Hashem also. The angels are nothing but the tool that God uses, but it's still direct. That's the big idea of today. But can angels intervene? Absolutely. And we have many stories. Now, I mean, even, this is not even talking about, you know, the Talmudic stories that talk about angels and the post-Talmudic stories and the 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 Hasidic stories and the Baal Shem of an angel. This, you know, we're not even talking about on that level. You have angel stories that are that 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 are that are endless. Um, but yeah, angels intervening, we definitely have this idea. Yeah. Are the angels under and this because the class we're learning in the morning, yeah. under the direction of Havaya or Elohim? Mm. We're gonna get there. We're gonna okay. get there today. Excellent question. Yeah. So we have messenger angels, we have guardian angels. What about the angels that are like um the spiritual existence of us? So you know that they're kind of like what keeps us alive. So you know the the, the angel. Were the flower, the angel. Uh, good. So, every so the Talmud says, good. The Talmud says that there is no blade of grass that doesn't have an angel or a mazel that says grow. So, everything has an angel. Like Asa had a guardian angel as well. Everything has an angel. So, you know, I mean, angel is kind of a loose term for spiritual energy. Sure. That's kind of what it, what it means that sure. spiritual energy is the angel. By the way, that's why tzaddikim can look at a person, a tzaddik, a real tzaddik, can look at a person and, and you don't have to say what's going on. They see what's going on. Why? Because every, it says in Kabbalah, everything we do, say, and even think creates an angel. Angel, i.e. the energy. You want to call it an aura, whatever you want to call it in, in modern terminology. It creates an energy. And, and that energy field is around the person, which means you stand in front of a tzaddik, a rebbe, and you have like many stories were told. People that went into Yechidus, went into a private audience with the rebbe, and they wrote down you know, a note of all their questions and they handed it in and the Rebbe read it and answered their questions point by point, like a three-page letter. And then they got home and realized that th they had given in a different piece of paper because the paper with their note was still in their pocket. <gasps> and so how did the Rebbe know? Because you're talking about somebody who doesn't need you to say anything to be able to see the energy. That's not, just like you and I, it, it's, not that, it's, not that, it's not that wild. Just like you and I, can tell when someone's in a bad mood or a good mood. You can feel the energy. If you if you're close with them, you can you can know that. A tzaddik has that amped up and can see more. So so it's but the point here is that what are they seeing? Angels. You can call it angels or energy, whatever it is. Angels are equivalent to, to spiritual energy. So the, the angel that represents us, that, is that um, the same thing that intercedes for us or guardian angels, or is that just you know, what happens to, to that angel? So if we, obviously everything that we do at that seven <clears throat> and vice versa. So is that just a separate part of us that just reacts and, you know, we do something good, that angel, something bad happens or it gets dirty and then we do something. Bad. The angel doesn't have its own... Vitality. Angel is created either by heaven or by us. In other words, angels don't create themselves. They don't have their own separate energy. So an, an angel is either something that sent by God to do something, intervene or whatever, give us a message, or it's created by us, an energy directed to someone else or to Hashem or into the world. Angels are just movements of energy, one way or the other. We have an angel because, I don't, I, we probably have more than one angel because we're always creating the angels around us. Remember the cartoons, little angel here, little <clears throat> devil there? It's not so far off. I mean, it's not at all accurate, but it's not so far off either because, no, I mean, it's kind of completely bogus, but it's also completely true because we all have, um, it's, both. <laughs> it's not exact. No, it's not exactly that. No, my point is it's not exactly that. The word similar I know, I know. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying this humor. So you, it, you, we don't have a little angel and a little devil with a pitchfork. That's not. But we do have, first of all, all of the products of our thoughts and words and actions from the day we were born. All of that is represented around us. Number one. Number two. 
we have those those desires and, and temptations and, and good ideas inside as well. Anyway, the point of this is that angels are messengers and packets of information. With that in mind, let's learn about matat. We started last week. And um, and I said, I think I said, Arlene, I think I said we were going to pick it up uh, this week. So I, I I brought from the from the Gemara, from the Talmud, that discusses Matat. We're not saying his full name. We'll keep that um, on the down low. But let's uh, let's pass this around. Let's do let's do some Matat. There's a there's a fascinating dialogue here in the Talmud. Please take and pass. And uh, let's do this. Um, I will pull this up on the screen. Give me a quick second. Here it is. Um, all right, Kabbalah Cafe, have a little faith. Supplementary text, chapter three, Matat. Maybe more so. Which one? Oh, have a little faith. Nice. Matat is an angel. Oh, we're about to see it. Yeah, not just. Yeah, this is like he's the dude, or it's the dude, or it's the it. All right, Matat. Um, a certain heretic. Everyone has a copy. Here we go. A certain heretic said to Rav Idit. Rav Idit was his name. Oh, it is written, and to Moses he said, come up to the Lord. Very timely, right? This is before the uh, the experience at Sinai. So God says to Moses, come up, come up to the Lord. Oh, one second. <laughs> let's be, let's, before we can't move further unless we understand those five words. Come up to the Lord. Who said that? Come up to the Lord. Five words. Who said that? Bob Jovi said a lot of five words. So. Nice. No, but who said? Who said come up to the Lord? Isn't that God? Huh? The third party that's telling you. Oh, the third party that's telling you. Right? So it's God. It's God. God is narrating, but God says to Moses, he said, come up to the Lord. So the heretic says, it should have stated, come up to me. If God is speaking, God should have said to Moses, Come up to me. God is saying, come up to the Lord. Then who's the Lord? You understand what's going on here? There's God. There's the Lord. God should have said, come up to me. He refers to himself as the Lord several times. I don't know if Rabbi Ari likes that answer. Oh. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he says, I am a shepherd. Right. Am... This is just one example. Okay. Maybe the heretic learned that verse and he got all excited about the question. But you're right. No, you're right. 100%. It's, you find that everywhere in Torah. But that was his. He asked. Everyone's, everyone's got a place where they, where they finally ask it. This is where he asked it. It should have said it. Come up to me. It did said to him, listen to this. But listen to this answer. It's not a cookie cut answer. You and I would have answered. He's speaking to himself in third person. Havaya Lukim, if you study Kabbalah a little bit, like different dimensions, third party narrator breaking the fourth wall, the office. I mean, you can get into like <laughs> different, um, yeah, different, the office. Everyone knows the office, right? So you can get into different um, uh, um, angles of understanding this, but listen to how, what, what Rav Idid says. Um, Rav Idid said to him, this term, the Lord in that verse is referring to the angel, Matat whose name is like the name of his master. As it is written, behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place that I prepared. This is when God says to Moses, by the after the sin of the golden calf. So he says, um, I'm going to send an angel with. Actually, no, 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 no. This is not after the sin of the golden calf. This is around the time of. Uh, no, this is not at the single okay? This is just along the journey. It says, I've sent an angel, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you to the place that I prepared. Take heed of him, of the angel, and obey his voice. Do not defy him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. Wow. Again, these are like lots of verses that we typically gloss over. God is telling, Hashem is telling Moshe, right? And and Publishing it in Torah that, that he's sending an angel, talked about guardian angels, right? Or angels that intervene. Sounds like it. Any angel that's that's getting involved in the in the journey. Uh, listen to the angel, don't define because why? Because he's not that forgiving. Remember, angels are not God. God can forgive. God has a lot of patience. Right? Angels, a mission. they're very like, like very, I don't know what the right word is. It's not a word, but like they're very um they're like one unidimensional they're very one-sided so it's like if you go against it it's like i must destroy you i mean it's something like along those lines right was that my robot voice or angel voice they don't have free choice 
<laughs> so what that means is that they don't have the choice to forgive. Clarence. They don't have the choice to forgive. Clarence. 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 Clarence Thomas? Yeah. I'm already mixed up. You don't know Clarence. We'll get there. <laughs> I know Alf. I don't know Clarence. All right. The, her the heretic said to him. It's a wonderful life. Oh, it's wonderful. Okay. I heard about it. The heretic said to him. I have to add it to my list. The heretic said to him, <laughs> written by Jew. If so, if this angel is equated with God, we shall worship him as we worship God. He says, the angel, God says, come up to the Lord. And Rav Idit says, the Lord there is not referring to God, but the angel Matat. So, so then why aren't we worshiping the angel like we worship God? Rav Idit said to him, it is written, do not defy Tamerhim, which alludes to do not replace me to Mireni with him. So the, the, he's, the, the, um, the Hebrew is being, being uh, um, analyzed here. Defy means replace. The same Hebrew word or same Hebrew shoresh, the same Hebrew source. <laughs> the idea here is the heretic. So, so, so even though there's an angel, don't replace him with me. The heretic said to him, back to Rav Idit, if so, why do I need the clause? For he will not pardon your transgression. Right, Rav Idit said to him, we believe that we did not accept the angel even as a guide. Be far vanka, for the journey as is written. He said to him, if your presence go not with me, raise us not up from here. In other words, ult ultimately... Moses rejects the offer of the angel. Moses told God that if God himself does not accompany the Jewish people, they do not want to travel to Eretz Israel. That was after the sin of the golden calf, where God says, okay, I forgive you, and now here's my angel. And Moses says, God or bust, along those lines. Like, well, Yeah, well, he refused it. He said, I don't want your angel. He says, if you're not going to go with us. Yeah, no, he says, if you're not going to go with us, then, then we're out. And we're not going to go on this journey. You have to go with us directly. And so that is the dialogue about this angel. Matat, thus, according to this Gemara, it's a fascinating dialogue. But the bottom line here is, according to the Talmudic passage, according to this dialogue, Matat, where you don't pronounce the full name, is the, his name is like the name of his master, which means this is an angel of the highest order. This is the angel that is considered to be the, um, the angel of angels. Like the one who's kind of, you God's know, right hand man. the top angel, top angel, and even that angel. But notice, even that angel, um, God says, "Do not replace him with me," which means that that angel still doesn't have any free choice and doesn't have any of its own power aside from the source. And that is the big idea that we are going to pick up again today inside the idea that angels do not have their own their own energy. Angels are but a, um, a representation of our own energy. Now, I'm wondering if I have the right copies here. Hope I do. I think I do. We're on page 40. Let's pass these around. Okay, we're going to pause in this handout. We're going to get back to the other part soon. But let's, um, let's pass these around. Was he concerned that they, people were going to defy the angel and then they were going to get severely punished? That's the answer. Moshe knew that he had a dialogue with God and that he could, you know, when things got sticky, he could appeal to God and make things less sticky. You're going to throw an angel into the mix? Yeah, that's not going to work. That's a bad idea. Take him pass, please. That is not a good idea. That is not a good plan. He's like, that's a that's a bad deal. Don't don't stick us with an angel because the angel is not going to help us when we need the angel. The angel is not going to understand. The angel doesn't have also that free choice to be able to take a pass, please. The angel doesn't have that free choice to be able to make that decision of okay, what when to let things go and when to not let things go. Um, so with this in mind, let's jump back inside to our um, to our main text. This is page number 40, where it says the axe and the hands of the woodchopper. We're getting, and we're going to finish chapter three today, so that next week we can start chapter four. This is really big stuff and very important stuff. I'm going to put this up um, for our Zoom crew. Give me a quick sec. Okay, it is up now. Here we go. The axe and the hands of the woodchopper. Um, by the way, I want to start actually with the last sentence, last two sentences from the previous paragraph where it says, namely, again, page 40, 
namely the power of a ministering angel or other purveyor of vitality, even the lakes of the angel Matat, called minister of the universe, is not something else besides God's essence. There's nothing else at all, for there's not, literally nothing besides him. Even in the Talmudic dialogue that we read, where he's talking about angels and, and the Lord is the angel, the, 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 the undercurrent and the underlying message of that Talmudic passage we just read inside is that the angel doesn't have its own volition, doesn't have its own choice. And it's synonymous with the name of God, i.e. the angel is transparent to divine will. The angel doesn't have its own intervening desire that could go against what God wants. It's only literally a messenger that must do his job. It is a tool in the hands of God. And that's exactly what he says right now. By the way, I have to mention one, one, one other thing. I must mention this. At the end of Hallel on Rosh Chodesh, there is a paragraph that we say three times. You guys familiar with this? In Rosh Chodesh? Huh? By Ram Zakein. And we say, we say, um, what's the other paragraph? The second paragraph. Zavadja. Zavadja Shmereni Vichayeni, right? The Zavadja should guard me and give me life. Zavadja should guard me? Zav you ever notice that? Zavadja should hook me up? Who's Zavadja? <laughs> Who's Zavadja? We're praying that Zavadja help us out? I thought we were praying to God. The commentaries have a very, very complicated conversation about this. Some say it's an angel, and we're praying to an angel, which is complicated. Do we pray to angels? Some say it is a machiv machnise rachman, high holidays. We talk, we, we, we seem to be praying to angels. Um, some say Zavaj is another name of God. And as we're praying to angels, we're creating another angel. Right. That's to called to that that's meta angel. matat. Right. That's a meta experience. But here's the point. The point is that even, oh, you have a center. Perfect. Yeah. 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 So the idea is that even as we evoke angels, if angels are are one with God, then it's not something separate. That's my that's the answer, basically. Right? If the angel is nothing but a tool, then what we're really appealing to is still Hashem. We're not actually putting in. You have it there, Zavad. You don't have it. Oh, right after Even right after how? You have Ram Zaki. Oh, you only have the one line. Yeah, you don't have Avram Zaki. Really? Look at Chabad stirring trouble once again. Unbelievable. Can't trust these guys. Unbelievable. <laughs> Um, okay, let's do this. The axe in the hands of the word chopper. The role of the ministering angels may be compared to that of an axe, which has no significance of its own without the wood chopper who uses it. Fantastic analogy. The axe has no choice over what it does or does not do. The generalities and specifics of how the axe is used are entirely up to the wood chopper's artistic vision and manual dexterity. I love that. Artistic vision and manual dexterity. I'm sure that is a loose translation of the original. Um, but anyway, the point is, and I don't know of the, of the artistic vision of a woodchopper. Does the woodchopper chop down a tree artistically or <laughs> is it more pragmatic in its nature? I don't know. I've never chopped down wood. I'm assuming that it's not necessarily an ax, but also any type of chisel or any type of thing that you're using. Maybe like a woodworker. I don't know why a woodworker is... I'm doing it like a woodpecker, maybe, but like a woodworker, right, would be carving something in a very specific and intentional way. The point is the tool, although the tool is doing that work, it's not really doing the work at all. It's the artist that's doing it using the tool, but it's still everything about it is the artist's vision and dexterity. The work is not at all attributable to the tool back inside, but rather to the craftsman or woman who acts through the tool. As for the saying, I, it says, this is separated by the M dashes. He's kind of, as we say in English, bavarning, forewarning, or preempting a question. As for the saying, a craftsman without tools is no craftsman, which implies that tools are a big deal. He says, no, the meaning, of, the meaning is not that the actual work of the craftsman is attributed to the tool, but that without the tool, the ability and proficiency of the craftsman cannot be actualized. And thus it would be effectively, thus it would effectively be as if he were not a craftsman. So in other words, that, that statement um, is, is basically saying that a craftsman. Where's that from? All right, whatever. An it's artist from. is not an artist without a brush. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So he clarifies. Not that the brush 
is creating the art, but that the brush helps the artist express it, uh, um, his or her artistic talents. Now, here's the thing. Uh, an, a real artist doesn't need a brush. Why? Because there's almost infinite media, media, mediums, Medium. mediums that can be used to express one's artistic vision, right? You can use your hands. You can use your, I don't know, you can use uh, paper. You can use, I mean, you can use so many different things to create art. That doesn't have to be a brush uh, with paint on canvas. The point here, though, is that if that is the tool that you need to express your artistic vision, then without the tool, you can't express, which means that, that there's something lacking, but not that the tool does it. It's still the artist that does it completely. Let's continue. May I, we, so it, the artist, okay, no matter what the artist is holding, be holding a brush, paint gun, whatever, right? Right? So great. I'm going to use this argument as a gun argument, okay? It could be a gun, it could be a car. Yeah. People kill people, kill people. guns don't kill people, right? Uh, so, yeah, but like, I think the idea here is that a tool... Right. The, the big idea here is that the tool is not getting in the way of the craft. It's the, per, it's the first. Yeah, but that's, uh, well, that's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Now, let's get we may understand the significance of all the specific categories of physical creation, inanimate, vegetative, animal and human in a similar manner. Understand what he's saying here, but th because that paragraph, although it seems innocent, is a bomb that's going off here. He's saying not only are angels only tools in the hands of God, but everything in our physical universe, inanimate beings, vegetation, animals, and humans are likewise tools in the hands uh, in the hand of the divine. We are also, we also do not have our own. Um, I don't know how to say this. We don't have our, we don't get in the way of God. We don't take away from God's oneness or from God's reality. It's not like, there's a there's God plus an angel equals two. It's we say the angel is just a tool in the hands of God. So too, in animate life, vegetation, animals, even humans are viewed in a similar fashion. Let's continue page 44. Now, by the way, the question, of course, is well, what about free choice? Free choice implies that we have our own narrative that we can write outside of God's narrative. That itself is a very complicated topic, which we are not going to address right now, although I've asked it. Next, 44. After it's stating mama. why it is Elohim. Okay, one second after state. What did I skip? Oh, I skipped 42. Excuse me. Sorry. Thank you. Page 42. Although each general category and each specific creation has its own degree of power and vitality. In other words, everything, rocks have their energy, plants have their energy, animals have their energy, humans have their energy, everything has its own um, energy and within every category of these four inanimate vegetation animals and humans there are a myriad of beings of, of specific creatures in each of these genres of existence nonetheless he says these do not constitute anything additional to god's essence they are just like the tool doesn't take away from the artist the tool is what the artist uses but it doesn't have its own existence or its own prominence just like an angel doesn't stand as a plus one to God, so too nothing else in existence stands as a plus one to God. God is the only one. Rather, these powers are all themselves expressions of Havaya. For this reason, in the statement, Havaya is Elohim, the name Elohim is in the plural form, signifying that the powers that enliven all species created, formed, and made during the six days of creation, i.e. all the diversity, Right, as well as each specific creation, whether inanimate, vegetative, animal, or human, are all expressions of Havaya. Havaya is a Lokim, and where do we say this? Again, the verse that we quote at the end of the Aleinu, hayom, you should know today and take it to your heart, Ki Hashem Hu Elohim, that Havaya is Elohim. What does that mean? There's two different names. Havaya is Havaya, Elohim is Elohim. No, Havaya is Elohim. What does that mean? Havaya is the oneness, the singularity of God. Elohim is the is the um, the energy that creates all of this diversity in, in creation. And the big idea as we wrap up davening, and as we're all looking to bounce out, we say the most unbelievable idea. All the way at the end of davening, we say the most mind-blowing concept. That all of this Elohim, all this diversity, is only Havaya. It's still oneness of Hashem. 
None of this takes away from the oneness because it's all expressions of God's oneness. Flowing through everything that exists, all the diversity flowing through everything is the singularity of God is Havaya. Havaya is Elohim. There aren't two forces. All the stuff that looks separate, that looks diverse, it's all Havaya. To us, it looks diverse, but in reality, it's all oneness. Even now, let's continue inside. Even now, i.e. after creation, it is he who brings them into being exactly as when they were first created. Oh, what that, sorry, what he's saying here is, even, is something. One might say when everything is first created, when Hashem first created everything during the six days of creation, well, then it was clear that God's in control of everything. But now, now that it's been a while, everything's on autopilot. So there's God up there and then everything else is kind of, you know, regenerating and doing its own thing. And, and so, so there's God plus a universe. And he says, no, even now, it's God who brings them into being exactly as when they were first created, i.e. the doctrine of constant creation, which we're going to get into um, right now. Basically, according to Kabbalah, really according to Judaism, but as expressed in Kabbalah, everything is constantly being recreated at every moment, may ayin liesh, from nothing into something. So think about a projector, think about a film. You're watching a film in a movie theater, and uh, someone pulls the plug on the, on the projector. What's going to happen? movie's over can't, can't see it why not i mean if it's being projected it should keep on going because the nature of light is the moment you 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 eliminate the source of light right the source that's emanating the light everything else that's a product of that ceases the same thing is true with god's creation none of this actually exists this is all a projection of god God's light, as it were, is projecting this into, into being. Just like light, in order to project, has to constantly be flowing, Hashem's energy of creation has to constantly be flowing into creation to make it exist. If for one moment, as the author of it says, I have it here, we'll just, you'll just read it at home, whatever, constant creation. If for one moment God were to pull back on creation, everything would cease to be. Everything would unfold into itself. Nothing would be any. Why? Because nothing exists on its own, nothing has its own energy, has its own perpetual um, existence or its own source of existence. It's all being ex pushed into existence, animated into existence at every moment by Hashem. Let's continue. Indeed, the verse that says, Va'ata mechaye et kulam, you give life, mechaye, them all, may alternatively be read as you give existence to them all. The difference between life and existence is life implies that the thing exists, Right, like a stone, exi the animal exists, and the life is giving it animation. But it exists, it's like a body, and then you have a soul. That implies that God's contribution is only animation to something that exists. We're saying something deeper. There's no existence without God. The base form, the essential matter, doesn't exist without God either. That's why he says, don't read it at the Mechaya Eskulam. You give life to them all, which implies that they, they exist. And then God provides the life. No. At the Mahava et Kulam. You create everything. Create means something from nothing. So at every moment, everything is being recreated. Not the soul is being infused into it, but the very atoms of its existence are being recreated every moment. Let's continue. Um, uh, you give existence to Mahava them all at every moment, at every instance, as it says, who in his goodness renews each day continuously the work of creation. We say this in Davening also before the Shema. The one we say God in his goodness renews each day continuously the work of creation. What that means is, as explained elsewhere, this renewal of creation is an expression of his, of his essential goodness for is the nature of the benevolent to do good. God in his goodness is renewing the lease on creation every day, but not only every day, continuously. Right? We say continue each day Continuously. One second. Is it B'chol Yom or Tamid? B'chol Yom means once a day. Tamid means constantly. constantly. So he says both are true. It's every day and it's constantly. But if it's constantly, what do you need every day? If it's B'chol Reg of Reg every moment, why do you need every day? It's just because you don't notice it at every moment. It's like, um, it's like you're watching a film. A film is comprised of frames, right? How, what do you, when you shoot film, what is it? 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second. 60 frames per second, whatever, whatever you're shooting, right? Different film has different frame rates. But if you could, every frame, so when you're watching a moving film, it's really not moving. It's really a, a juxtaposition of many still frames played in sequence, correct? 
That's how you animate. It's a flip book. It's classic movement. So the world is being created frame by frame at every moment. It's like the old animators, the old Disney animators. If you wanted to make Mickey Mouse move, right? How would you do it? You would have to draw the scene from scratch, hand-drawn with a little bit of a difference. God is mechadesh betuvay b'chol yom tamid my reshit. Every single moment of every single day, he's renewing creation. Everything is being redrawn. Everything is being recreated from scratch. There's no such thing as prior existence. It's just kind of rolling forward. Everything is brand new. Face of God rested on the seventh day. That's why it's right in the face of that. No, well, puts it on autopilot. But on Shabbos is no seriously. Time out. Time out. Time out. It's a very good question. The idea of resting on Shabbat, according to Kabbalah, means something a little bit different. And it's it's a it's so big of a question, we can't deal with it right now because we just want to like kind of beeline. It's an excellent question, but there's a different dimension to that rest that really elevates our understanding of Shabbat. But it's a very good question. Now let's let's keep on reading inside. He renews and re-enlivens old things each day continuously, and not just each day, but each moment. The daily renewal being slightly more recognizable is explained elsewhere. In other words, when do you notice the renewal? Every morning. When does it happen? Every moment. But it's so every, it's being played. The film is being played, right? So you don't notice it. But when you sleep and then you wake up, it's like, oh, it's a new day. A new day, bro. It's a new day. Every moment, it's a new day. Every moment, it's a new existence. Every moment, it's a new reality. You could say it's a new day at any moment of the day or night. It's a brand new, it's a, it's a brand new universe. That's what that's the implication. It's a brand new universe, which means that everything that exists is only being made in this moment for in, in that realm, on that level, for the very first time it's being made right now. Everything is nothing, everything is nothing but God's creation of it in that moment. It doesn't have its own existence, right? Its own reality that is then kind of rolling on in its own way. Everything is literally being made from God a a anew. Let's continue page 44. And again, we're going to go to chapter four. After stating Havai is Elohim, the verse intensifies the point by explaining, right? We say again, via Dai Tayom, Basha No today place your key Havai Olakim, Havai is Elohim, Basha Maimimal, in the heavens above, Bialars, we talk about that in the world, the, the heavens above and the earth below. And then we say two more words, Ain Od. What does that mean? Let's go. After this, the verse intensifies the point. And it ups the ante by explaining that there is nothing else, ain't no nothing else besides his essence. That is, what does that mean? No forces operate in partnership with God as explained elsewhere. You can't even say that not plus one, but a, it's not God plus one, but God with, you know, using something else. Not even that can be said. Not even a partnership. In order to, to negate that notion of partnership, which is Shituf, uh, um, um, the idea of partnership. To negate that, the verse reiterates that there is nothing else. Indeed, all the signs, now we bring it back to the Exodus, and we're going to wrap this up. It's powerful. Indeed, all the signs and wonders were brought upon Pharaoh in Egypt for this same purpose, in other words, for this educational purpose. This was a pedagogical moment to prove that there is none like me in the entire world, and by logical extension, there is nothing else. That was the plague. That was Exodus. What was the what was the what was the educational purpose of the Exodus ten plagues? If God wanted to take the Jewish people out, you know what He could have done? Could have taken them out. Could have taken them out. Why the plagues? A year of plagues. Why? Why the plagues? It was educational for the Egyptians and for the Jews to know that there is no other force that stands outside of God's control. Nothing else exists other than God. Nothing else exists. The signs and wonders showed them that the ruling constellation of Egypt. The Mazal of Egypt had no power to thwart or stand in opposition to God and was by its very essence nothing additional to God's existence, but rather like the plowshare used to plow, the axe used to chop, and other similar analogies. In other words, what God was showing Egypt and the Jewish people is that all of the energies and the angels and the constellations of Egypt, all of their, their so-called gods have no power, have no self-autonomy have no ability to thwart the will of Hashem and thus everything is by definition God's, do God's doing. When the Egyptians beheld and recognized the greatness of God's miracles and the punishments to which they and their gods were sentenced, they all believed in the one single, single God, albeit for the moment. 
for they saw that the ruling constellation of Egypt was powerless to oppose God and save them from his hand. It is the finger of God who is ruler and controller of all, even on this earth, and not as they had erroneously believed that he had abandoned it, i.e. leaving its control for other forces. So, um, you know, in pedagogy and education, it's there's always a good exercise to think about when you're lesson planning, to think about, okay, what will the student come in with? What will they come in thinking? And what will they walk out knowing? Right? What's the previous um, thought? And what's the subsequent recognition? So it, he says the same thing is true when it comes to the plagues. The Egyptians before the plagues believed that there were other forces in control, not God, other forces in control, their gods, their constellations, their Pharaoh, whatever it was. And the plagues were an educational experience to teach them that indeed there is nothing else in control, not just in heaven, but also on earth. There's nothing outside of God's control. Everything is directed by God. Everything is controlled by God. Everything else that seems to exist is only kagars and biarachotz. It was only like the axe in the hands of the woodchopper. It doesn't have its own energy, its own vitality, its own autonomy, its own its own um, provenance. It doesn't have its own its own uh, will. Doesn't have its own um, desire. It it is all being controlled by Hashem. Ain od nothing else. There's nothing else. Whatever appears to be is only what appears to be. It's only it's only an appearance. But in truth, everything is controlled by Hashem. You have to understand this that this is what sets up an understanding of the sin of the golden calf. All of this, and this is what we're going to get to next week, all this is going to set the stage for understanding how could the Jews, led by the Erevav, the mixed multitude, how could they have gone ahead and created a calf to worship and say, this is the God that took us out of Egypt? After all of this, this intensifies the question, right? After this recognition that there's nothing else in control, there's only God, not only in control, nothing else exists even other than God, Everything else that appears to exist is only, uh, uh, it's only God's, um, it's only God's projection. It's all God. It's God flowing through it at every moment to make it be. So it's only God. Everything is only God. After that, how could you ever worship a golden calf? How does that make sense? We're going to explain not only does that make sense, it was the obvious next thought. I know it's counterintuitive, but we're going to see it next week. So what we did today was we explored angels. We also explored the, 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 the notion of constant creation. And we saw how putting those two together, the idea that angels are only packets of divine information, messengers, etc., directed by God, and the idea of constant creation, that everything is constantly being recreated by God, putting those two things together, we understand even deeper that ain't owed, that there's nothing else other than Hashem. Havaya is a lokim, what appears to be a lokim, diversity, multiplicity in creation, all of these you know, myriad of, of entities and billions of atoms and molecules and, 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 and organisms on earth and beyond. Everything is Havaya, everything is oneness. Everything is Hashem flowing through everything. That was the educational message of the plagues, and that is the Exodus story in a nutshell. The Exodus is teaching us there's only God. There's only God. Only God's existence is the only existence, and everything else is a tool, is, is, is a manifestation of, but nothing else has its own, its own actual reality. Okay, Go ahead. so where does this leave us for this week? Uh, on the doctrine of constant creation, if you have a challenge in your life, recognize that this challenge, uh, that the challenge that existed a moment before, no longer exists. What I mean to say is that that whatever baggage we take with us into the next moment is, I don't mean necessarily a challenge to subjective, but the stuff that we take with us is a choice that we make to take something from the past and bring it into the future. Because this future is a blank, or this present really, is a blank slate. So we don't need to bring the previous stuff into it. You know, sometimes people are like, okay, I need to start again. I need to do something radical to start again. (laughs) Kabbalah says, nothing radical has to happen. This moment is a blank slate. Make this the the moment where things are different. So may indeed we, we view every moment as a new opportunity and take advantage of the gift of the universe that God is creating for us right now. Shavuot Tov. Yeah. Questions, yeah. Seems like Hashem wanted to prove to the Egyptians that God was. It means like maybe they got it, but it was a history, and it didn't really find the living one God until two generations. What? What? Why? I mean, God did that for that generation. Then, good, good. So what we're about to say, this, this, 
your question is an excellent question. It touches on literally the next chapter. Um, human beings are interesting in that we learn lessons and things are very true and real. And we're like, yes, that makes so much sense. And then by the next moment, we forget it, right? We have moments of clarity and epiphany. I've said this many times. It's like the pigeon I've been, right? When you have a Bukhar, right? 30 days old, you go to a Kohen and you say, um, here's my son born to my Israelite wife. And the Kohen says, which one do you want? Your child or five coins that you would have to pay me for the redemption of your child. And you say, hopefully, take the five coins. I want to keep the kid. Question is, what, and, and there's literally the dialogue, the lines that are written out. And the question is, Meshuga, who would ever say, I'll, I'll keep, keep the coins? The answer is, well, yeah, when the kid's 30 days old, for sure you'll, you'll keep the kid and, and, and forgo the money. But what happens a few years later, right? What happens a few years later when your child needs you, but you're on a phone call? You're like, wait, sometimes you choose the money over the kid. So the message, so my point is that there are moments, right? I don't mean like you're not actually going to give up your kid, but I mean like priority, right? Prioritize, like what's the priority? So, so my point is not, it's not, uh, my, my point is very simple. Sometimes there's things that are clear and obvious, but give it a little bit of time and things become a little bit cloudy with a chance of meatballs. No, things are a little bit cloudy. Why? Because, because I don't know, we have other things. No, but you know, revenge, you know, I'm going to show you what, you know, I am, and I'm going to give you 10 plays and make your life miserable. Then it seems like that's what we could say. We failed. No, no, but one second, but one But think about this. The question is asked. I want to answer or address the question by asking another question. Why is it that we don't find um, miracles of, of biblical proportion post biblical times? Why don't we find this again? Why doesn't God intervene? You know, with uh, you know, with ten plagues, you know, in other situations. And I think the way the commentators explain it is because God says, "I will teach this lesson once." I'll write it up in Torah. And now, although you're gonna, it's going to be hard to remember, but if you ever need a reminder, read this story. In other words, this lesson is meant, Hashem knows that we're going to need to review the lesson, but it's printed in Torah, right? It's written in Torah and we can study it. So when we study it, what are we learning? We're learning that Hashem is in control, that nothing else has control, that Hashem is the only force, not only in control, the only force that exists, all existence is only Hashem. You and I are the characters. I, I didn't develop this. We ran out of time. Uh, you, you and I are the characters on the movie screen. Yeah, you see, um, who's an act, actor? Matthew McConaughey, right? You, random. you see him. I just read his autobiography. You read, you, you see him on the screen and he's moving and he's jumping and he's doing something. Is that him? No, it's light. You with me on this? It's, it's not him. He's not there. In the Lowe's theater, that's not, he's not on the on the screen. What is that? It's light. But we, oh, we're for sure real. Why? Simulation theory. <laughs> Welcome to the Matrix. Because, huh? What is the memory for? It starts. Oh, point. good. What should, what should you learn? God wants it to be small, man. Right. man, there are movies like that. <laughs> yeah, Groundhog Day. I don't know, right? Something like that. always doing the same thing. Yeah. That's a very good question. How do we know the names of the angels if it's not in Torah? I would assume that it's one of those things, I'll pick Kabbalah, like Greece, like um tradition stuff that we receive that we know the names but that would be a good research um activity to look up where do, where's the first time that the names of the angels are recorded that's a very good question we would have to look that up yeah that's what we have to do. yeah well the um no i mean the, even the talmud discusses matad as we read today so that's going back i mean zohar and talmud are from essentially the same relative era 15 16 1700 years ago so it's going back far but i think your question is where does that come from it wasn't inspired by that Moshe written down in the Bible. right where now we know that hashem told a lot of things to moshe that he then verbally conveyed and is printed in the midrash etc that might be one of those things or it might have been i don't know that's a good question we'd have to look up see where what's the origin of the names of the angels
It's a good question. But to your question about memory, it's because I think, I think it's because Hashem wants us to be in the simulation and not realize it's a simulation. Part of this is that we should think that it's real and we would have to come to the recognition through study and through experience that, wait, it's, I mean, it is real, but it's only real because Hashem is making it real in this moment. I think the to make decisions in the future. Right. At the same time, you are willing to accept the fact that the decision you reach is something that is uh, determined by uh, something beyond your capacity. Right. I agree. And that's that's where the free choice comes in. If everything was obvious that we're created in this moment from Hashem and Hashem is flowing through us, if it was obvious, it would lack the um, it would lack the the meaning of of the positive choice. David, great to see you. Arlene, great to see you. By the way, if anybody and I know you, everybody here is I know is uh, is, is basically a, a Kabbalist. Um, this course, Supernatural, is off the hook. This is like. This week, astrology. I know we spoke about astrology a few weeks ago, but this is like more stuff in astrology than we have curses, jinxes, evil eyes, kanaharas. This is fantastic. <laughs> then we have <laughs> angels, <laughs> demons. Now, as opposed to creating certainty. Say it again. Is what? Is what we're talking about. Yeah. Thanks. What you what you believe, what you see, what you see, read. Good question. I think it is. It's an excellent question. In other words, is the purpose of this to question everything we know about reality and be like, oh my gosh, this is not real? I don't think it's meant for the shock value and for the like, you know, hey, look at this, nothing is real. Like here's the the curtain being open, and you know, Wizard of Oz. I think the point is to recognize. That Hashem is so much a part of our reality that even the stuff that we take for granted as us is really Hashem. In other words, like our our literal existence. It's not that Hashem created Adam and Eve back then and then ever since people are making people. But it's every every one of us is also created by Hashem. You and I are God's creation. At this moment, God is choosing to create me, which, by the way, I didn't mention this as a kind of a party message, but I could mention as, as a party message now. That's a that's an that's an incredible um uplifting message. The message is that Hashem has chosen you and I to recreate in this moment. That means that we're here for something very special. Hashem says, I'm creating you in this moment. I'm 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 putting you back in. You're back in the game. It's like, wow, that means that's something that's meaningful. Mm -hmm. Hashem's choosing me in this moment to create. That's significant. Mm -hmm. That means my life has value in this moment. Yeah. Do you remember the book came up to my house? So there was a class who written a book on how much of your life can control you. Uh, I'm trying and to remember. And his party in the night and she was in the dining room. It fits in so many different ways. You don't control what happened yesterday. It's gone. It's just right. Gone. You don't control what happens tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You may think you'll make plans for tomorrow, but the plans are not guaranteed. Not know. at all. Right. So what you control, and the way he demonstrated was, he said, this is what you control. This moment. Right now. That's all you control. And it, uh, who was that? Try to remember who that was. He was also part of the five, and that he wrote the book he wrote, which um what you it's something to the effect of what you control in your life. Which part do we control? Powerful. So that's and that that kind of aligns. In other words. Like nothing else exists because the past, yeah. that previous creation, that's not doesn't exist anymore. The future hasn't yet been created. The only yeah. thing that exists is now created by Hashem for us to do something magnificent. This way, you don't have to go. Because I'm coming anyway. Yeah. So, pick so much take it back to you know. Yeah.
Well, can I get pictures? Yeah, if you don't, don't want to come. Why are you remembering oh, Jeff's already got that? The way Kabbalah explains it is that when God creates this frame, like the film, right? Imagine you isolate a frame. When Hashem creates this frame in this moment, he also creates kind of under it all the previous frames, as it were. In other words, he creates the present with all of the past on some level and with all the potential for the future, but not in a way that gets us stuck, but in a way that we, of course, remember. So it's a little bit of an interesting... Yes, yes, that would not be a bad term, animator. But the animator, it's, it's important to remember that animator doesn't only mean that God is making the thing move, God is making the thing the thing also. That literally making the thing the thing. I think the best example in, in our physical experience, I don't know if it's the best, but like one is this example of... Um, oh, hey, Lisa. Awesome. I'm glad that you, that you guys are here, Lisa and John. Um, so, you know, the projection example, right? You show, you, know, you have a projector, you show a video, you show a film, whatever it is. Those aren't real creatures. Those are literally just, even TV, even the pixels, there's pixels on your screen, right? Those are pixels. And, and, if, the, and if the pixels, I don't know, if the light source, I actually don't know how it works, um, the TV. But like if, there's a, if the light source goes out or whatever it is, I don't know if that's possible, then you're not going to be able to see anything. It's not, it's, it's constantly being, I don't know, I'll stick with the projector because that I know. He never knew from the Tsaras. My father didn't know from waking up four times. My father didn't know from the ED. He went around the phones. This is all. God calls this. I'm going to call that. He called him. Yeah. I find your point. I find when I learn, like on Safaria, you know, Safaria, the, the website. So when I learn on Safaria, because I don't have a book nearby, so I have like my phone or my computer and I scroll through it. If I don't have, if I'm not studying it from a book, I will not be able to remember the page and the layout. Because like when you study it in a book, you can recall it and you can be like, you can associate it with the, the positioning on a page. Like on the layout, especially of a Torah, like a, a Jewish book page, you usually have like the main content in the middle, commentaries on the side. And so you're, you're able almost to imagine like when you study it, you can associate like a law with the commentary and, and the positioning. But when you're just scrolling, nothing nothing has a place right there's no right as you said about retention nothing exists i saw somebody sent me a, a funny uh image of people on the train this is probably 100 years ago and they're all sitting on the train reading the newspaper there's like 50 people and they're all reading the newspaper and the joke was like we think today everyone's like distracted on their phones and like in their own world they were also in their own world then when they had a newspaper i'm not saying newspaper but it's, it's People were always on a train distracted in their own world. Yeah, it's like we say, oh, like, no one's social today because everyone's, I mean, to a certain extent, yes. But like people were also, their heads in a newspaper on the train, on the subway. You know, they were also, we'll see. Any Seinfeld reference is always, uh, is always good. Oh, that's a good answer. That's a good response. All right, I'm going to I'm going to um say hi and and uh, shoot to everybody. So John and Lisa Ellen, great to see you. Henriette, great to see you. Sorry? No, no, I actually didn't see David today. Larry, great to see you. Welcome, welcome. Adam, great to see you. And Mariana, of course, great to see you. Hope all is well. And, oh, you were also on? Oh, oh, no, we have a different Adam on also. 
All right. Well, great to see you guys. Shavua Tov. And um, have a wonderful week and an uplifting week and a spiritual week and lots of blessings. Lots of blessings. Right. Guys, take care. Shalom.